This is Talk for Food. Your portal into quantum possibility. I'm Adam Abraham. Each week I'll be your guide on this expedition where we'll explore the near and far reaches of this thing called life on Earth and beyond. Talk for Food is brought to you by Philos Books. Publishers of I Am My Body Not, A Freed Man, An Emancipation Proclamation, and Transdermal Magnesium Therapy, and producers of Understanding MMS, Conversations with Jim Humble, the only feature-length documentary on the subject of the Miracle Mineral Supplement on Earth. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Talk for Food, which comes to you over webtalkradio.net. I'm Adam Abraham, and we are talking about quantum possibility. We're going to journey today, journey in many, many ways, because today's show is about a journey. It's also about quantum possibility. Um, I journey to a very long one in this case, we're really not, it's very short, to Mesa, Arizona. Uh, this week's show is a result of a phone call that I got uh, last week, and I just kind of did not get off of it, so it became this week's show because I'm still actually appreciating the effects and the realizations that I've been having. I was introduced to a fellow, uh, a, f a friend of mine called me and said, hey, there's someone you got to know about, and guess what, he is like right in your backyard. And his name is Ron Hatton. He's called Gadget Man, and his website is gadgetmangroove.com. I thought it was a dance or something. I didn't know what this was all about, but I tell you, it's about uh, an insight he had that affects the internal combustion engine which is basically the what, what powers m the bulk of our transportation industry all of our methods of getting around uh, the emitter of fossil fuels unburned po fossil fuels this is huge uh, and what's fascinating is that uh, Ron is using what essentially is uh, a method to take something away from the product in order to get more out of it okay he's taking something away from the design he's itch etching something out in order to get a profound improvement in the combustion of the actual fuel and I learned some things about uh, how uh, the internal combustion engine is presently uh, implemented that well it's it's disturbing it, and mainly disturbing because now we know, uh, at least I am convinced, that there's a better way and this represents it. So we're going to take a break and we're going to get into this uh, journey as I put my own car on the block, if you will, <laughs> to have it have its groove on, <laughs> put on. Uh, so, and you're going to hear the process and if you're watching and find this on 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 uh, the net you can watch the video but we will when we come back we'll introduce you to ron hatton the gadget man and his groove when talk for food returns on webtalkradio.net american adventurer jim humble discovered how a simple chemical compound and powerful oxidizer chlorine dioxide could be effectively used to reduce toxicity within the human body the buzz on Jim's discovery, MMS, Miracle Mineral Supplement, is spreading, but not the understanding. Until now. Understanding MMS, Conversations with Jim Humble, is a new DVD available only at understanding-mms.com. The Understanding MMS DVD will show how you can be part of your own solution to toxicity. 
Here's the documentary producer. This is Adam Abraham inviting you to get informed and help others to be informed of this amazing way to reduce the body's load of toxins, harmful microorganisms, and pathogens from the waters inside our body. Get your understanding today for only $29.95 at understanding-mms.com. That's understanding-mms.com. Use passcode RBN to receive 10% off. Our health really depends on it. We're going to get this segment of Talk for Food going on webtalkradio.net with Adam Abraham. I will set the stage as we introduce you to Ron Hatton, the Gadget Man. And it was on a 113 degree day uh, just last week here in Phoenix as the uh, summer just is on getting ready and, and just gotten started. And uh, man, it was amazing to see what has happened or what uh, what unfolded and actually what has unfolded since then so here goes with an introduction here's Ron Hatton all right well my name is Ron Hatton gadget man I own a company called gadget man technologies and it's based on a discovery that I made what we're here to do today is to show the real-time results on this beautiful 1993 Lexus SC 300 owned by our videographer here uh, Adam Abraham and uh, take a look at the, at the car, get that in there, so everybody sees this is a real car. And uh, how long have you had this, Adam? Uh, it's been five years. Five years. Looks like you've taken really good care of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that. Yes. So, um, so now what we have here is we have on display uh, the real-time exhaust that's coming out of the vehicle. It's been sitting here for about 10 minutes. This number here is the hydrocarbons. In other words, that's the raw fuel that is not processed by the engine. Uh, that's coming out the tailpipe and we can see the numbers climbing here all right below that is the oxides of nitrogen now when any this is created by temperature and duration of burn okay this number here and this number here is carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide which is the number one byproduct the greenhouse gas uh, carbon monoxide is what kills you and then underneath that we have the relative oxygen content and the air fuel ratio perceived air fuel ratio coming out the end now what I'm going to let this do is I'm going to let this run until it stabilizes, then I'm going to commit these numbers to the modification report form so that we can show very valid before and afters. You see this? Look at how it's climbing. Over 2,000 now. Can, is it, can you see that? At this point, Ron had hooked my car up to the uh, small tester had put uh, a probe into the uh, exhaust so pipe and it was measuring hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide and CO2 uh, and nitrous oxide and the numbers were rising. And what I learned is that what was actually happening is was this was the last of three phases. The first phase is what is actually vaporized and combusted. All right, that is what allows and uh, facilitates the, the engine moving. And I was talking before about the automobile, but this is really and specifically about the internal combustion engine and the air intake. So the first part is what is actually combusted that's turned into a vapor or vaporized in such a way that allows the combustion to burn to cause the engine to move, to change. Uh, that's one phase. The, other, the second phase is what passes by the air intake because of the molecules being too heavy, they are not burned. They're still in a liquid state. And what Ron explained to me is that if it's still in a liquid state, you can't burn it. It has to be changed into a finer vapor state, vaporized state, and that requires oxygen in order to happen. And so if it didn't happen in that first pass, the next pass is the catalytic converter. And so the catalytic converter then basically heats up that. It brings it up, uh, the temperature up, so that, guess what? It can change into a state that allows it to be burnt off. Okay, that's phase two. The third phase is the actual hydrocarbons that are emitted as 
pollution, we might call it. The nitrous oxide, the carbon monoxide, the carbon dioxide, and the fourth one I can't think of right now, okay? That is what comes out the tailpipe, all right? And that's all the emissions. But what we were learning, or what he's saying, and uh, this has been corroborated, uh, there's a uh, website called fueleconomy.gov, 62% of the of what goes into your car i mean or, or, or what you're spending your gas for 62 percent of it or more is actually going out in is either being burned up in the catalytic converter or it's going out in as pollution but it basically means that it's unburned all right that's the key, the key here it's not burned See, and the computer doesn't care, which is the most amazing thing to me. They should have a hydrocarbon sensor instead of an oxygen sensor. Because if, if the computer knew that this was coming out of here, which it can tell, but if they actually put the programming in there to where it didn't need this fuel, you'd be saving so much money. When you think about it, uh, uh, what, I've, what I've proven, what my research shows, is that about 90% of your fuel goes outside the engine, in fuel state, liquid fuel and it is not burned, it does not drive your engine, it doesn't do anything except get processed in the exhaust. And that's why they consider our vehicles 95% efficient. They're measuring the quality of the exhaust and not the quality of the fuel and the power that's delivered to an engine. Right. But so essentially though, a lot of fuel is, is moving by the combustion process with, with, in terms of how it might deliver power mm -hmm. without actually delivering the power, then it's yes. processed on the back end and used mm -hmm. up. If, if I may, let's go to the whiteboard here, and I'll show you, uh, we're going to let that run because it's still climbing. Um, all right. Back in the old days, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about from 1910 all the way up to the mid-70s, our fuel chemistry was very simple. It had some three or four common compounds that were hydrocarbons. Then, all of a sudden, there came this uh, vapor carburetor phase, uh, a craze, really. And you could open up the comic books in the early 1970s and see build your own vapor carburetor plans, only $4.95, right? Well, the oil companies, and this is theory, this is hypothesis, but it's backed up by, by solid fact. In the 1970s, we had our first ever energy crisis. Now, we had tankers in the Gulf that were waiting to offload their oil to the refineries, but the refineries would not accept the shipments. They weren't allowed to. What happened then is they changed our fuel chemistry. When, when we had the vapor carburetors, what they did was they used very small apertures called jets that caused a greater difference in pressure and increased the vacuum that's applied to the fuel. Well, that was allowing the fuel to vaporize completely to mix with the oxygen. So they said, well, we'll fix this. So what they did was they added some higher level hydrocarbons to the mix, much larger molecules, so that when this fuel went into those carburetors, they stopped working, and that ended the vapor carburetor movement. We didn't hear any more about it. There's still myths, but they don't happen. But in order to keep the BTU level stable, what they had to do is they had to add a number of higher level, smaller molecule hydrocarbons. You'll hear stories about people that go into a barn, and there's a 1935 Edsel sitting there, and they put a battery in it, turn the key, and the thing starts on the fuel that's been in there for over 50 years. Now, if you leave your car set for a year, what happens is these molecules are so small that they slip right through the lining of your, of your fuel injectors and your gas tank and right into the atmosphere, which this is where your horsepower is from, and this is your torque, all right? This burns longer, so it pushes more. Anyway, leave your car sitting for one year now, and it won't start. Why? Because this is gone, and all that's left is the heavy stuff. So the same thing happened in the vapor carburetors. This stuff would pass through it, but this would be left behind it would just plug the carburetors causing them to stop working. Right now, at your point of ignition, you've got only about this much of your fuel in vapor state. That's it. And right here is your O2 sensor. All right? Well, what, the, what happens here is that this sensor measures the quantity of oxygen present. So when this burns, it consumes oxygen, and then you have oxygen and fuel side by side moving past the oxygen sensor. The O2 sensor picks up that value as, as the fuel leaves and then alters the fuel kit, alters the fuel delivery. So this ignites and pushes the piston down and then here it leaves the engine and all of this is burnt in your exhaust. This is 95% of the bulk of your fuel. 
What we're going to do is we're going to apply the gauge man groove to your vehicle and you're going to watch the numbers over there change. What happens is it amplifies the pressure curve inside your engine. When the piston's at top dead center and the valve opens, there's no vertical movement of the piston. Here the pi it rolls and the piston is now moving vertically fast as possible at 90 degrees and then it slows down to the bottom and that creates a wave, right? A drop and an increase in pressure. You're listening to Talk for Food on webtalkradio.net, also on iTunes, with Adam Abraham, and we are in the groove. <laughs> this is an account of uh, my meeting Ron Hatton, the Gadget Man uh, and the Gadget Man Groove, and we are, or in fact he is, he's explaining how and going through the process of uh, applying the, a groove uh, channel in the throttle body of my 1993 Lexus and basically the intent behind it is to increase the amount of usable air or should I say the amount of air that the that is available and um, therefore making it possible for my car to burn more of the fuel and not have the fuel simply be burned up after moving past the air intake through the catalytic converter which as we're finding out and learning perhaps a good 60 percent or, or more of the air is actually lost or the fuel is lost through the cat, uh, cat, catalytic converter it's not i don't know if they even lost the point is 60 percent of the combustion potential is lost and therefore it is simply burned up and what is not burned up is spit out of the exhaust pipe. What the Gage Man Groove does is it, re it retains a portion of the intake airstream for the first half of the downstroke and then as the aerodynamics switch from building pressure to releasing pressure it releases that air to be delivered to the fuel. The result is your pressure curve which runs something like this from about 19 inches to about 15 inches with a 17 inch median vacuum changes it like this to 28 to 29 inches of vacuum. And these are reports that my customers are getting. Well an amazing thing happens at about 24 inches of vacuum and that is that there isn't a liquid that we know of that will withstand that level of vacuum and stay in a liquid state. Why is this important? Because you can't burn a liquid. It has to mix with oxygen before it can burn and then you can burn it. So you have, the fuel has to be rendered into vapor state. Now what they're doing is they're running the engines hotter. You need an electron exchange, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that is. That's it. Yeah, it is. Well, with the oxygen, it, it uh, facilitates that. Yes, yes. Well, what, what we're doing is instead of applying BTUs to the fuel to vaporize it, we're applying an enhanced vacuum. Water boils at 212 degrees, right? Wrong. Here it doesn't. It boils at like 209. Why is that? Because we're at a higher altitude. The correct the correct equation is it boils at 212 degrees at sea level. In Denver it boils at 203. Okay? And the difference is because the, the pressure is lower on, on the liquids so it boils easier. Now, after the gauge man groove is applied, what you're going to find, and when you drive the car, you're going to be, I'm going to put you on camera, okay? All of this fuel is then rendered into vapor state before the point of ignition. So, you get more of your fuel pushing down on the piston, which results in more power and less work for the, for the exhaust to do. So it's not much to process by the catalytic converter. So the, so the engine doesn't push as hard as the, as the fuel is leaving, so the engine breathes better, resulting in a lot, you'll see, a happy engine. Here the oxygen sensor is somewhere right about here. Okay? Well, you would think that since there's so much less fuel, the relative oxygen content would go up. No, the oxygen content goes down here because in the process of combustion you consume the oxygen. So when you burn all this fuel, what happens is there's so less oxygen there that it thinks that it doesn't need as much fuel, and it's true, it doesn't. So in order to keep the air fuel ratio correct, the computer reduces the amount of fuel being delivered, and that's where the mileage gains come from. Well, as it turns out, less fuel is actually needed. Exactly, okay? exactly. Because more is available now. Well, more is, more is actually uh, being used by the engine. Exactly. So more is usable. Now. More, yes, right. More usable fuel out of the same amount of fuel you put in your tank. Mm -hmm. I got it. I think, I, I think I'm getting it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, got a, I've got a 1985 Ford Ranger, 89 Ford Ranger right now up in Michigan. Uh, Todd Roderick. I, I 
I think he may have blown his engine, <laughs> but he was getting, he reported over 100 miles to the gallon. Wow. Over 100 miles to the gallon. I have wow. a pickup truck. Wow. Amazing. Oh, now let me get this. Mm -hmm. All right, what we got? All right. Looks like it's peaked out. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get ah, this clip okay. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we've got here is a max reading of 3988 on hydrocarbons. That is 3,988 3, parts per million hydrocarbons coming out of the tailpipe that the catalytic converter cannot process. Uh, oxides of nitrogen, the killer gas, 191. Uh, it's been up at high, it's 202. Carbon monoxide, 7.62%. Oxygen at 0.6%, 0.63. CO2, 36% of your exhaust is CO2, 36, 30. What's it saying now? Did I just lose my connection? There we go, 36.17. And air fuel at 13.7. Now this, this is measured one part fuel to this much air. That's what that number means, 14.1, all, right? okay. all right? So at this point, we're going to go ahead and uh, turn it off, and I'm gonna get my hands hot. Okay. All right. Okay. So this doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's fuel injected or carbureted? No, nope. because we're not dealing with fuel. Uh -huh. All we're doing is, is affecting the, uh, the dynamics of the air, the, the way the air behaves. And, uh, you know, I, here, I went through a learning process, of course. I'm still learning. I just made a discovery a couple of weeks ago about <laughs> the groove is the groove is the groove. It works. It just does what it does. But the, 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 uh, there are other systems that affect your fuel efficiency. Trust me when I tell you there's, there's several systems that are engineered for poor efficiency, like your PCV valve. Mm -hmm. PCV, positive crankcase ventilation. Okay. And that means a vent. The, pro the point of that was to allow the fuel vapors that are normally created when the engine rolls, um, the friction is the heat. So the EPA wants those fumes to be vented into the intake airstream so that it can be burnt along with the fuel. Right. But the problem is that it represents a direct drain on the vacuum system. And 24 inches is what we're looking at. Once we hit 24 inches, everything's rendered into a vapor. And, uh, and when you put a PCV valve on it, instead of getting, say, 18, say, say 21 inches of vacuum, it might be possible to be created. Instead of getting that, it drops up, keeps lowering the vacuum available. Okay. And that vacuum. And, as the, and as the, it, the, lower, the lowering occurs, the efficiency is also going down, so to speak. Right. As, as, yeah, as the pressure rises, the efficiency drops. Right. Okay. Exactly. Volkswagen on their, on their new Beetles, they've got a vacuum pump to power their, uh, oh. excuse me, their, uh, their emissions controls. And they're really efficient. I've done, I did uh, one of those, and it um, is running at least an extra 100 miles per tank, which is really cool. And it's got horsepower like you wouldn't believe. Wow. Runs okay. around like a Mustang. It's a stick shift. And it, you, can, you can drive that car starting out in third. It will burn rubber in first. It will burn rubber in second. It will burn rubber in third. You know, but what I am still he hearing you uh, say mm -hmm. is that the, uh, the way our cars, automobiles, have been designed mm -hmm. over the the lifetime of this emissions thing. I, mm -hmm. I recall when catalytic converter converters came in, uh, but they have been designed uh, with with inherent inefficiency, yes. uh, so that they are literally burning. Uh, not that they're burning; they're just using up a, a hell of a lot more than right. they 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 could would have to or need to. They're consuming it. Yes, but you're not using it. That's There's right. A big difference. It's yes, like that's what I say. Using up. Yes, that's exactly right. That's right. I mean, that's when we're talking right. about uh, because it makes all of this uh, technology uh, laughable when you start talking about hybrids and you talk about this, that, and the other. It's laughable. What would you say if I told you that I can prove to the average person you don't have to have a multiple PhDs? that the EPA tests have been rigged since the origin of the tests to where they cannot show a mileage increase, no matter what happens. 
That's why out of the dozens and dozens of devices they've tested, nothing has worked. Come on, th there have been hundreds of thousands of inventions tested by various mechanics. You, nobody's going to invest their money into that kind of a process if it doesn't work. If they haven't seen some gains, they're looking for validation. I did. I went through two rounds of EPA testing. First time the vehicle went from 25 to 35 miles to the gallon, and the tests showed that it was only getting 19 to start with. And dropped to 18.6, from 19.5 to 18.6. And I scratched my head. I said, "Well, it's an old truck. You know, maybe something broke." Uh-uh. But so I turned to the people that were trying to help me get this thing going. We're almost there. Um, and uh, I told them this because the because the postal service called me up and asked me that if that I would be interested in seeing how the the groove would. Uh, work for their fleet because it's the largest privately owned fleet in the world and uh -huh. they spend eight million dollars a day on gasoline Okay, I can reduce it by at least 50% oh, I can do that. Wow, I can do that. I, I know because I did it on one of their postal vehicles uh, Unbeknownst to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything more about that because it's going to be published, right? Right, right. but uh, By hook and crook I had one of their LLVs that's based on the 88 to 92 Chevy S10 frame uh, receive one of my model bodies, my throttle bodies. What a lot of people don't know is they don't only get 12 miles to the gallon max, their entire fleet. And wow. that's insanely Jesus. poorly efficient, right? Put my throttle body on there and not only did the thing go from a max of 12 to over 19 miles to the gallon, but the driver refused to turn loose of it because it ran so good. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't want to turn it truck in. <laughs> he didn't want to turn it in for, for his service. So. And I was just so tickled to hear that. Now, have you taught many uh, mechanics to do this yet? I, I actually, I have taught quite a few people. Um, if you'll notice on my board right up here, see these names? Yeah. That was my first ever class of folks that come by here. See, with this technology, it is so beautifully simple. I've taught a 57-year-old medical transcriptionist how to do this, who the most she had ever done in her life was change her own oil at the age of 18 with her father's help. Okay, uh -huh. she can she can do this now. And uh, a medical doctor out of California uh, heard about this, but she's really into green. Everybody you know that cares about the planet cares about what I do, and I just yes. I'm so blessed. Right, and and they don't necessarily want to throw away their their cars and uh, yeah. simply because uh, to be talked into something that's supposed to be newer and greater. Yeah, you know? exactly. especially if you can do something with what you got. And let's just say that I could produce an engine, because theoretically, if I could produce an engine that you could replace this with, and it would cost you a total of $1,000 parts and labor to do it, that would take you to 75 miles to a gallon, would you replace your engine $1,000? Very few people would. They can't afford it. We can't afford to lay out $1,000. My goodness, I, I, the economy is collapsing. All around us, our, all our investments are gone. You know, thank you, Enron, and a lot of other folks that hold political office. I won't go into that. Okay, now we're loose. Um, now, if we can't afford it, that means that for a good 50 years, and this, this is based on a report by the EPA, that if a new technology comes out that will allow us to replace gasoline engines, we still have a gasoline-based uh, economy for the next 50 years. And I can see it. I can right. see it. People uh, don't want to change. That makes sense. Yeah, sure. It's, it's going mm -hmm. to take some time. Mm -hmm. We're coming up to a break time on this uh, conversation and, in fact, even demonstration this of the Gadget Man Groove with Ron Hatton, the Gadget Man, uh, here on location in uh, Mesa, uh, Arizona. I will tell you here and now, this was about a, it was about 113 degrees, and it's not that we were, uh, it was 113 outside. We were outside. We were in his garage, but basically <laughs> we were outside. So, uh, in fact, the air temperature where we were was probably higher than 113 degrees. It is really was uh, amazing. And this is also, I'll say after the fact right now, for my car to be running at uh, running cooler, and we are in the heart of the Arizona summer is pretty, pretty um, illustrative of the effect of this uh, process, of this procedure. We'll be right back 
uh, on the second half, and this will continue when Talk for Food returns on webtalkradio.net. Jim Harshman is made to change from water treatment to water transformation technology, having installed a unit from Photonic Water Systems for almost two years now. He tells you in his own words what has changed. Well, here's the problem we had um, when we built this house in uh, 2005 or 2006. Uh, we got it done and found out the water was extremely hard. There was a lot of calcium buildup on the on the uh, outside of the pool and also into the misters uh, inside the courtyard. And so we know we had an issue with the water right off the bat. So in trying to solve that, this is where we started to play around with the different options that were in the market. Kind of explored what was on the home shows at the uh, different uh, uh, green shows and also home shows that the Phoenix area was having. And, um, you know, it, it was just a major problem. So we had to get it solved. And uh, we ran into the product and, and uh, we, I guess we can't say enough about it. I mean, it took a, an intolerable scum problem, a white hard water problem, and just neutralize it to where we don't have the buildup anymore. We don't have the buildup on the pool, the courtyard fountain, or into the various uh, systems that we have, such as your misters and your, your shower heads. So it's 100% work. Mm. Now, how it works, I have no idea, but <laughs> it's not how it works that I'm worried about. It. Available at photonicwater.com. We come in all shapes and sizes, but for all our apparent differences, we share an important oneness. I am my body, not... Now your child can discover the oneness behind human diversity with I Am My Body, Not, from Philos Books. This progressive book written by Adam Abraham helps parents and teachers introduce some of the most basic human concepts and questions. Celebrate the body and the spirit with I Am My Body, Not. Order now, just $19.95 plus shipping and handling. I Am My Body, Not, is available at philos.com. That's P-H-A-E-L-O-S dot com. Order yours today. Hi, this is Mary Meadows, and you're listening to Talk for Food on webtalkradio.net. Second half of Talk for Food starts here and now on webtalkradio.net with Adam Abraham, and we're talking fuel efficiency by doing less, by taking out something as opposed to putting more and more complexity. We're talking about using simplicity to have a tremendous effect, a tremendous reduction, a profound production on fossil or hydrocarbon emissions by helping the engine, the air intake, to use more by using vortexes which we have come to learn about as we've seen this same principle being applied in water treatment through our photonic water uh, transformation technology. Our guest is uh, Ron Hatton, the Gadget Man. We're in, in Mesa, Arizona, and who developed the Gadget Man Groove. And he's applying it, and you are hearing the process while we talk and while he actually applies this technology to my 1993 Lexus, whose name is Lex. Anyway, let us continue. But if you could do something to get a, a significant improvement yeah. in what we already have, right. we could be talking about uh, uh, 40, 50 miles a gallon for, for vehicles that are doing uh, 10 and, and 15 now. It's, very, it's, it's not uncommon at all that people report 50 miles to the gallon after what I did. I got one guy who is driving a, a 93 GMC, high protect performance chip on it and all this stuff, and uh, he got five times his gas mileage, almost six, almost six. You think that made an impression on him? Wow. Even if he was getting only 10 miles a gallon, you're talking uh, 60. <laughs> he was only getting six. Well, that's still a 36 miles a gallon. That's, that's almost twice of what I've been getting with Lex so far. Yeah, he actually went from six and a quarter to over 35. So, yeah. 
You've apparently worked on quite a few cars. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Uh, been working on them since I was knee high to a buffalo nickel, my granny said. <laughs> now, what I'm doing is I'm just cleaning off the residual. What happens is we were talking about the PCV valve earlier. Is the PCV valve actually puts a vacuum onto your fuel. Now, when you reduce the pressure on the liquid, it boils at lower temperature, right? Okay. There's heat inside your engine. So the oil that is sitting there that keeps your oil fluid and liquid is the higher level of hydrocarbons. Well, when you put a vacuum to it, it sucks that right out of there. That's why within a few days' time, we're running a brand new oil change. It starts to get thick because it's pulling those high level hydrocarbons out and making your oil slower and less resist, less, less lubricating. When we, what we're going to do, one aspect of this is we're, we're going to disconnect that valve. We're going to, it doesn't need there because you've got two lines that are venting your crankcase. One comes, goes into the intake air stream in front of the throttle body. Oh, here, I'll show you where that line is in a minute. And the other one is a vacuum that's attached to your intake manifold. Well, you don't need that dynamic vacuum for it to be a vent. And as long as you cap that line off, it's not going to vent any fumes into the intake, in, into the atmosphere. It's all sucked right in just like it's supposed to be. But as a result of the way they're set up, they pull some fumes into the throttle body. Now, this is your throttle plate. And this is where the groove goes. All right? If I may, before I do this, since we're doing the video, let's, uh, let me show you a little bit of the principles behind this. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a little bit of the science behind the gauge main groove and why it does what it does. All right? First of all, remember, the crankshaft, as it rolls, there's no vertical movement of the piston at top dead center. It's pull, the piston is attached to this, so as it goes, it speeds up to here, and then it slows down, and then stops, and then reverses direction to go up on the compression stroke. We're your only concern with the intake stroke. In that process, your pressure wave kicks in like this. From your, so you got a 17 inch median vacuum, 19 inches will be the low, and uh, say 15 the highs, just approximately. It'll vary from engine to engine. That pressure wise, so you've got a variable pressure, a variable pull, a variable vacuum on this side of the throttle wave, because all of the air is going this direction. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to have to cover a couple of different points, a couple of different dynamics to explain how this actually does it. First of all, all of the air is going this direction, okay? So when the air hits this plate, in order for it to continue that direction, it has to drop down this plate, where it then goes in and becomes part of the intake air strain. So all of the air that hits this plate is then compressed into this small area here. That's a massive amount of compression. So you wind up with a very high pressure zone here and a very low pressure zone right here. Right here is where your air bleeds or your vacuum pores are, okay? Now, let's, let's make this a little bit larger. Every throttle body has some mass to it, there's some thickness. So that's where the gauge man groove goes. Now, the design is very sensitive, and you'll understand why once you see the dynamics of it. So there's your system, the air comes in and it's compressed, this way. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, now let's insert the gauge main groove right here. That's not the shape, it's, it's kind of like that, but it's very sensitive. There's three areas that are of critical importance to this groove. That's this area right here, because what this area does is, it's, is it captures a portion of the air. See, air is a fluid. It molds itself to the shape of this container. As it comes in and hits this plate, it compresses. Then when it hits that groove, it drops and rolls. You can see how that would happen. So what happens is this captures a portion of the intake air strain. What I theorize to be somewhere between 40 and 60% of the air going below the axle is actually captured by the groove as the piston speeds up. Because as the demand increases, as it's pulling here, what happens is the downward pressure on the groove increases, and that's for the first 90 degrees of rotation. So the air below this line is captured and rolls up here into a nice tight little ball and the faster the air moves as it moves closer to the midpoint the more dense this ball becomes. But wait there's more. There's also the stream of air that comes down this direction. It is also pushed down into the groove by the pressures being created. You're creating a vortex. Double vortex. Because it has to be a double vortex. If you don't have the double vortex, it will not work. And you'll see why in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But as these two streams collide, they roll up together, you know, just like that. Yes. So, so this builds up in pressure, right? Now this air stream here, this stream, is what creates this first group, this first ball of air, mm -hmm. right? This winds up being about a thousand times minimum, really. I, I think it's vastly more dense than that because it's taking 40% of the engine's air demands it as a minimum and compressing it into a groove that's only about an eighth inch deep. 
That's a lot of air in a little space, all right? So this winds up being about a thousand times more dense than this, one to a thousand. Well, this ball of air is creating this ball of air. Mm -hmm. One to a thousand, one, this, winds up, this ball of air winds up being also a thousand times more dense than that, or one million times as dense as the, as the intake air stream. I understand, yeah. There's a big difference between a thousand times something and a million times something. Mm -hmm. So what happens as the piston passes the midpoint, the aerodynamics don't go, oh, well, no, they switch. From building pressure, the pressure comes off, and this little tiny ball of air goes off like the primer in a shotgun shell and shoots that ball up into the intake airstream, where it expands somewhat and continues its travel to the intake valve. Okay? Whereas you had a more or less a steady stream, little low level pressure wave, now you've got a tremendously dense, maybe 500 times the density of this. This ball of air, it's, man, it's dense and it's rolling. It's, 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 it goes down the intake manifold because of the demands of the other valves. It's like rolling a pencil across a tabletop. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what keeps the balls in shape until it hits the valve. So here is the beginning of the intake stroke, and here's the end of the intake stroke, and the next valve picks up, right? So the pressure drops, and, and it's holding up the air, and then it delivers the air to the piston. That's the same circle here. So what happens is instead of getting 19 inches of vacuum, when you resist that flow, the pressure drops to 28 to 29 inches of vacuum. Thereby increasing the uh, efficiency, the power, etc. And, cetera, and, and decreasing, because this is actually no more fuel, but simply denser and more potent air. Uh, no, actually, there's two things that happen. Okay. Okay. Because the first step is the fuel has to be in a, in a vapor state before it can burn. The vacuum, uh, over 24 inches of vacuum, there's no liquid that we know of, that I know of, outside of mercury, that will withstand that level of vacuum and stay in a liquid state. So what happens is all those big, heavy, higher, uh, the lower level hydrocarbons, the big, thick molecules, they're ripped into fuel vapor too. This is where your power comes from. Mm -hmm. As a result, this, when this ball of air hits that valve, there's nothing left to keep it in shape. So what happens is it expands in an explosive fashion and blends the fuel vapor that the vacuum just created in the second half of the stroke. And what I'm finding is that we're, I've seen redu reductions in mass content pass through the engines of 39% reduction in, in mass mm. being reduced wow. that much. So in essence, then it's making the gas more available. Yes make more of the gas available at the point of ignition. Rather, because it burns, and it's a long process now, because 95% of your fuel burns in the catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. Well, why should I- After the cow has left uh, the barn. Yeah, the cow's already up. What right. good is it gonna do, you right. know? No, no, and they're adding heat to the engines, which is an engine's enemy, is the heat. Mm -hmm. So they're raising the temperature of the engines to make the engines wear out sooner. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, all they gotta do is, is get rid of the vacuum leaks and they'll create more vacuum. Volkswagen's got it, their vacuum on their engines is now 21 inches. They're still not doing what the Gage Man Group can do, but. Wow, now let's go wow. Cut them, amazing. With this lesson in fluid dynamics under our belt, Ron proceeded to uh, do the groove, uh, to apply the, the groove uh, principles or practice into the throttle body of my Lexus took all about 10 minutes uh, in actual time. After that, it was just put it back together and measure the difference, see what the change was going to be. Hydrogen, zero carbon monoxide, 0.3% oxygen, 13.6% percent of carbon dioxide, and the air-fuel ratio up by two full measures. Two full measures. Wow. I believe that's proof. Isn't that proof? Talk about the evidence, that's it. That's real, wow. my friends. Uh, a little groove can make a big difference. And again, we're talking about putting a groove in an existing vehicle mm -hmm. and having, uh, if I put a, a graphic up of the numbers mm -hmm. that it was putting out, mm -hmm. and it was approved mm -hmm. by the uh, the Department of EPA, the, EPA, the, 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 the state yeah. EPA, mm -hmm. so yeah. so it, ADOT, whatever it is, yeah, so it, it was in spec, mm -hmm. but this is significantly less than what it was. You're listening to Talk for Food on webtalkradio.net with Adam Abraham, and we are, in fact, you're also hearing something that uh, was produced on camera, so this entire 
uh, program was videotaped, and we're uh, the, it was a visit with Ron uh, Hatton, the Gadget Man, uh, and who is the progenitor and developer of the Gadget Man Groove, and basically a simple, simple way, an elegant way, a, a very subtle way to affect the air intake on an internal combustion engine to have a profoundly a profound increase in the its engine's ability to burn more of the fuel that has become increasingly harder to burn because of the more com the complexity of the fuel. Well, here <laughs> here I am in Mesa, Arizona. I'm talking with Ron Hatton. The uh, so what we call it the groove, uh, the gadget man, the groove. Gadget man groove, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I thought it was a, a dance or something, or so, you know, trying to figure out what this was about. Yeah, makes the air dance. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, you're right. It is dancing with air. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and I got some friends who have a book called Dancing with Water. So, oh, yeah. and, and we talk about vortexes and things Sweet. like that too. Yeah. But um, not knowing what was going to be about, mm -hmm. I, obviously I had to bring Lex over. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got some amazing technology. And not only you got something to talk about, you you just did it, you know. We uh, we came in. You looked at the uh, at, at Lex, uh, and uh, went to his secret places and got got acquainted. <laughs> yeah. But the bottom line is, uh, uh, it's had a, a measurable and a uh, documentable change, a dramatic change in uh, the emissions, mm -hmm. uh, but also in the. Uh, uh, it's rev. I mean, I've, I've driven it afterwards. I mean, you, you did it, you took it out, mm -hmm. you put it back, you obviously know what you're doing, mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's very, very different, you know, in a it's, very, very it's positive just, way. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I spent uh, about 25 years of my life working towards increasing fuel efficiency. Mm -hmm. I've tried everything under the sun. I mean, you, they got wires you hook up onto your O2 sensors. They call them FEs. They got HHO splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, dumping that in your engine. And, you know, sometimes you'll get a gain for a tank or two, but it usually winds up coming back off mm -hmm. when the computer adjusts to it. Well, th with this, it's exactly the opposite. I found a way to, uh, well, the shape actually, it's just a very, very special shape that is carved into the intake airstream mm -hmm. that causes a resonance. It has to be put in a certain place. It has to be at a certain angle. It has to be a certain shape. But when you get those dynamics correct, and it's simple enough to duplicate once you understand the dynamics, mm -hmm. then it causes a, a change in the resonance within the intake manifold. And it's, it's, there's a wave, there's waves to everything, there's vibration everywhere around us. Mm -hmm. And when you amplify what the engine's already doing and can create well, what we're creating, <laughs> you know, may, it runs better when you take the load off of it. And that's what it seems to do, mm -hmm. uh, increasing fuel efficiency by uh, amplifying the pressure wave inside the engine. Yeah. Well, in so doing, it is actually getting greater utilization of the of the fuel that's already there. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're not leaning the engine out at all. What we're doing is most of your fuel currently leaves the engine still in fuel state. It hasn't been burned. Unburned, yes. Unburned. And that was that's the purpose of the catalytic converter to catch those raw fuel particles and to cause them to wait long enough. And the catalytic converter is a blockage in the system. And it has to be a blockage to catch the heavier particles. Then it heats up because the exhaust is burning all the way back to the catalytic converter and it slows down the fuel so it burns there rather than being exited into the engine causing acid rain. That's but you know, the, the metaphor for this though, in terms of the catalytic convert converter, yeah. is that is is literally sweeping it sweep, sweeping the inefficiencies of the engine mm -hmm. under the carpet and making it apparent that they're not there yes it's it's actually yeah it eliminates a lot of the inadequacies that have gone into the engineering of the engines you know it's just it's, I, I say it masks them it makes yeah. it appear like a, yeah. so I, that's my my point is that there whether it was by intention or not the sure engines the that's yes, right the the engines are in, uh, let's not say that they're inherently inefficient, but there are levels of proficiency much higher that are available yes. for our existing engines, our existing motors. Yes, and then what the catalytic converters do is just simply make it appear that the, the gas, so essentially they're burning a hell of a lot more. No, they are not burning gas, but the catalytic converter burns it afterward and makes it appear as though 
this got right. done. Yeah, exactly. See, they've changed our fuel chemistry starting back in the 70s with our energy crisis. The fuel chemistries were changed. With they, they give us. They made it harder and harder to burn the fuel, and then they keep bragging about higher efficiency. But what they're doing is they're slowing down the combustion process by changing the fuels. They just reduce the power by adding heavier molecules. Well, those heavy molecules don't have time to burn inside the engine because they have to absorb so many BTUs. Well, now they're raising the temperatures of the engines, and they're getting the efficiency up, but there's two factors that affect your fuel, your, your fuel vaporization. It has to be in vapor state before it can burn. So if it's got to mix with the oxygen, it's got to be in vapor state, well, let's use the vacuum that the engine's already creating and amplify that rather than try to elevate the temperatures. It's that simple. Well, the one thing here is that if we made no claims of power, if we made no claims of um, fuel economy, you put that aside, yeah. we have taken emissions and had a profound reduction in emissions. Oh, tremendous. Well, yes, I'd say so, from almost 4,000 parts per million hydrocarbons down to, what is it? Zero? Is, is zero? There's a zero. I saw, I saw yeah, nothing. Yeah. Zero hydrocarbon, zero carbon monoxide, zero oxides of nitrogen, and I've done it hundreds of times. Now, would this uh, have, is it enhanced by the catalytic converter, or does the catalytic converter, in essence, become uh, superfluous? Uh, no, the, the catalytic converter is actually a vital piece of equipment, as far as I'm concerned. It is possible to render it just no longer needed. All right? It's it just a vestigial piece of equipment. Once you get the fuel efficiency up to maximum, and what, uh, what maximum to me is like 100 miles to the gallon, mm -hmm. then there's nothing coming out of the engine. You're using all the fuel inside the engine. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. So there's some other tweaks that you know of that can be done? Yes. Right. Well, we're going to keep it at that. We're going to keep it to ourselves until we get those. But the, the, the wonderful thing is that you're not simply talking about it. You say it, you demonstrate it, and then we tested it. We showed the before, and we showed the after. And the after confirms what you said all along. Is your engine happier? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can feel it. It's as it's, it's smooth as can be. Uh, it revs easier. Uh, it For the uh, amount of pressure that I give, it seems inclined to go faster. So, uh, and that's just on a few minutes of driving, but clearly I see it. Yeah, with less pedal. That's what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Less pedal, faster speeds, engines. Just, it's it's really... It is amazing, because most people want to believe in others, right? They want to believe in our leaders and our corporations. And I want to believe in them too, but the plain fact is I can't. Mm -hmm. Because knowing what I know about this means that if out of every $4, $3 of that is leaving your engine without giving you any benefit, in fact, it's a detraction from the power you could receive, if 75% of your money is going out your tailpipe, and I can prove it, right? I proved it right here. Mm -hmm. Don't they know better? I mean, if I can do this in my driveway with Dremel, Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think Detroit, with all of their millions and millions and millions of acres of research facilities and the thousands and thousands of people that are up there studying this stuff every day, do you think that they, they couldn't do it? I, you know, come on. I, you know, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. Just a guy just like you mm -hmm. and just like thousands of people out there. They're, they're just trying different things until they find something that work. God just smiled on me. Well, I, I, th I, I appreciate you, you, one, doing it. As someone who's out the box, and we uh, we know what that means in the sense of you you need to. Uh, well, Einstein said it. You can't solve a problem thinking from the level that, that the problem was created yeah, from. Yeah, the thing yeah. that created the problem is not the thing that will solve the problem. That's exactly right. So you got to look at it from a different way. And when all of the um, uh, you know their 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 accolades and their degrees and and their credentials are all based on being able to just uh, say what has been then there's nothing there's nothing innovative that's going to be happening uh, i really like the idea of uh driving lex here and getting a 500 of miles of, of range uh versus the 300 that i get now okay on a tank of gas i mean the, the brand new cars are talking well we can get 500 500 miles okay fine but look at all the people out there who don't aren't ready or able to buy a new car and yet they could be getting uh, a tremendous amount of additional uh, mileage on what they've got. And it's not just cars. Mm -hmm. Any gasoline engine, they all have the same part in there that I work on the throttle body, right? You saw that. Mm -hmm. So I, cover, I, cut a groove in, oh, I cut a groove in the throttle body at the throttle plate. Because of the aerodynamics present there, the groove is allowed to work. It's allowed to function. I can do the same thing on any gasoline engine. Anybody can, and I want to teach people because it's easy to do.
It's easy to do. Well, the, the website is? Oh, it's gedgemangroove.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ron, we're going to talk more. We're going to, we're going to work <laughs> some more things out. But the fact is, it is gratifying to know that we can make a significant change mm -hmm. in fuel consumption uh, in, uh, and uh, efficiency. Oh, you were talking about how like oil mm -hmm. uh, for the, the, the use of the oil. Someone was, you had well, the, 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 the oil in for, for, yeah. for 10,000 miles because the, the engine is running cooler, mm -hmm. more efficient. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, yeah, I've heard. I keep getting reports like that back that instead of changing the oil at 3,000 miles, when they go to, go to take a look at it, it's, it's not black. It's honey brown, and it stays that way vastly longer. I'm not going to say don't change your oil, guys. You do what you want to do. But, you know, I don't change it if it doesn't need to be changed. Mm -hmm. why, why should I? You know, spending more money, it's wasting, it goes into the environment, and we got to our Earth has got to deal with that. Well, why should we use it? You know, we don't have to. But, yeah, the, so the engine temperature drops. The exhaust manifold temperatures are dropping by a minimum of 200 degrees mm -hmm. because the engine is consuming the fuel there instead of exiting out the engine. So it's less temperature on your engine is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And if we're able to do that, your engine is going to last vastly longer. You know, wait, wait till my spark plugs come out. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, then. Ron Hatton, it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a pleasure. And uh, we'll talk more. Thanks a lot now. Okay, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. I say bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. It has been really a pleasure for me to meet people who care about life and uh, the way we do things and are taking active steps. They're just individuals who have or who are following a, a hunch or an intuition or an insight. Uh, they have an understanding that may not be mainstream, but they are willing to follow up with that understanding and to demonstrate its efficacy. Here I have come across and met uh, Ron Hatton, Gadget Man, and for a show that I call uh, For Talk for Food, where we journey into realms of quantum possibility, looking for the small thing, the small change that's going to make such a, a major difference in things, the groove is certainly it. What it is and what uh, Ron Hatton has done is followed an intuition and insight into how air is processed inside an automobile, an internal combustion engine. And he has found that he is able to, by making a specific type of trough in the intake uh, or the throttle body of an automobile, he literally can increase the amount of oxygen that's available by using something that's familiar to listeners to my show, a vortex, in this case actually a double vortex is caused or created by a modification he makes to the throttle body, which affects not the uh, fuel, but the air intake. It potentizes the air tremendously. And uh, in so doing, it affects the air fuel ratio, basically increasing, making more air available for the uh, given amount of fuel and it basically allows for more efficient burning of fuel. Now what it does mean is that there is a tremendous, a profound reduction in the amount of emissions that the car puts out. We're not making any claims about fuel economy or fuel uh, mileage and the changes because from one car to the next it can be different. However, if there is a major reduction in emissions that are coming out the pipe, it means that a tremendous amount of additional fuel is now being uh, consumed or combusted through the proper channel. The catalytic converter is the great big sweeper, if you know what I mean. But at any rate, my car is running wonderful. It's smoother, it's running cooler, and it is now in the hot season here in Arizona and my car is running cooler. I haven't gone through a tank of a gas yet, so I don't know what the difference is, but I know there is an improvement. If you have any questions or comments, this is all the time we have. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for me, you know to reach me at adamanttalkforfood.com and check us out next week as we come back with something else from outside the box and beyond the curve 
when Talk for Food returns with Adam Abraham here on webtalkradio.net. Be well and see you next week. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you next week. Talk for Food is a Phylos Media Works production.